Hi guys, my name is Britt Gunser. I'm a physical therapist, a strength and conditioning coach, a Roadrunners of America certified run coach, um, and a runner. I work here in the Greenwich Office of Performance Optimal Health as a physical therapist. Um, I live in Manhattan actually, so I'm part of the Manhattan running community, but I will soon be moving to Stanford. So I'm gonna join Megan and all of her community events. And I'm actually super stoked about that. Um, I'm Megan Sirfoss. I own Ridgefield Running Company and Darien Running Company, which just opened up in July. Um, welcome everybody that has, knows me. I also um, founded Run Like a Mother in 2008 and now is a national race series. And I authored See Mom Run, Every Mother's Guide to Getting Fit and Running Her First 5K. Running is my thing. <laughs> Love that. Well, welcome all you guys. We're so happy to have you guys here. And I think this is a really great topic to touch on, especially after the year that we all just had. And I can speak for myself and every other runner that we've probably hit the pavement outside more so than usual with the lack of opportunity to go to a gym um, for a few months last year. So that's kind of what we're, what we're here to talk about. We're here to welcome anyone who picked up the hobby or the passion in the past year um, since other opportunities and other fitness opportunities were taken away from us and kind of point you in the right direction of, okay, now things are opening back up. Um, what do we do now? We got into it. We kind of like it. What's next? So a couple of objectives that I have for this are to talk about what happened last year. What were the trends last year compared to the previous years? Um, for new runners, I want to touch on training errors that we commonly make. And I see them, Megan sees them. Everyone that walks into her store has some kind of story and I'm sure she's got some good ones. Um, discuss what to do other than just running because that's what we were doing. And there's things to do that are going to help your running that actually aren't running, believe it or not. And then talk about, like I said, what's next? What opportunities do we have in the community um, in around Fairfield County to, you know, whether it be join run groups or set a goal to run your first 5K? Um, what do we what do we do from there? So Megan, I figured we'll talk first about running trends since COVID began. And I have some fun statistics. Um, everyone new to running has probably heard of Strava. It is an app that everybody uses. It's kind of like the Facebook, the social media of running. You post your runs, you track your own runs, you can plan your routes, you can see it, it does a whole analysis of everything. And so from doing that, they're able to gather data from their users. So they had some really interesting data from comparing 2019 and 2020. So I'm just going to spit a couple of them out at you that are going to go, okay, wow, re people really did start running. So per month in 2020, after March started, 2 million new users registered per month. That's crazy. crazy for them. So they're up to 73 million users now and 24 million of them just came in 2020 alone. So think about that. Those already using the app, so non-new non users, increased their workouts by 13%. 33% increase in activities logged in the past 12 months. So that was 1.1 billion activities. Now, they can you can log cycling, you can log swimming, you can log a workout, you can log walk at, walking, and you can log running on there. But 1.1 billion activities have been recorded in the past year. Um, despite cancellations of all of the major marathons, uh, hundreds of thousands of marathons were recorded in Strava and it was a three times as many as 2019. So right, a lot right, of runners, they, isn't Strava, that crazy? Strava, Strava had a thing where um, people were recording marathons and we actually have a customer that does it. He did it on his quarter of a mile driveway. Oh my God. I saw, I saw that. I think that was all over Instagram. Mm -hmm. How many laps was it? A lot. <laughs> So things like the New York City Marathon that did it virtually, I can't speak to the other ones, but I know New York City, you had to log it on Strava in order to get the credit for it. So a lot of them were logged for the virtual marathons. Uh, but yeah, you saw some pretty crazy routes. You, you could also see people that were like spelling out thank you to the healthcare workers and stuff and their routes. And that, that was kind of cool. Um, and then one other interesting thing is, so they have running clubs and running um, events and challenges that you can join on Strava. And there was an increase in clubs created and athletes joining the clubs in 2020 because all of a sudden we were we weren't able to run with our friends we weren't able to run with our typical running clubs and there were no local races or anything so people were kind of seeking external motivation from these um 
clubs and events. So 30,000 clubs were created in April alone and 250,000 athletes on Strava joined those clubs in April alone. So that was just April, 2020. So obviously I'm just spitting some facts here, but it went up like crazy. And Megan, I'm sure you saw an uptick of people running around the neighborhood, running around Darien, running around Richfield. Um, I live in Manhattan, right by Central Park. And the amount of people that I saw in Central Park, I was telling Megan last week that I guess it was maybe two or three weeks into the pandemic. And I saw a girl running in Stan Smith sneakers. And you're just like, you know, welcome. I'm glad to see you. I hope your feet don't hurt, but it's great to see people running. What do you think of all that, Megan? I think it's amazing. And from the very first day, I think it was March 16th or 17th. Mm -hmm. It was actually <clears throat> the state of Connecticut gave us a four day warning that the stores were going to close. Mm -hmm. And those four days we did worked incredible hours overtime, everybody getting like their last chance pair of running wow. shoes um, for athletes that were currently running. And then once the pandemic, um, once everything was shut down, I think that the the greatest thing about um, about movement outside is that we could do it. Mm -hmm. We could do it um, as long as we weren't near people without a mask on. We could do it safely. And then the other part is that um, that it's an incredibly mind opening and awakening totally. um, sport. And so when you're stuck with your kids inside all day, or oh, you're yeah. Um, stuck with your whoever inside all day. It's just a moment to get out and clear your mind and get raise your heart rate and really, really um, give yourself a, a little bit of a break from all of the stress that was happening. So we had a tremendous amount of people, um, the not a runner people that had never done anything like this before and they were getting out and they were walking and not only walking they were they were like oh maybe i'll start running a half a mile maybe i'll start running a mile and then and then all of a sudden 20 pounds later right or um or two minutes a mile faster they were right. killing it and they were realizing that this is something that you can do from you know a toddler to the time that you are saying goodbye to all of us um, movement, any sort of it outside is quite possibly the best gift that we can ever be given, especially during this time. I absolutely agree. Now you said your, your money phrase, the not a runners. Can you explain to our listeners what well, you mean by that? So, um, unfortunately we named the stores Ridgefield Running Company and Darien Running Company and I guess it can be intimidating to many to think that they're going to walk into a store where everybody might be running a four minute mile or they might be they might walk in you might walk in and somebody's talking about their splits or their mm -hmm. their Boston qualifying time or whatever and it can be really intimidating so we actually have a sign in our store that says I'm not a runner because so many people come in and say that. And then when we sit down and qualify them, they're running, you know, and then they'll say, well, no, I'm a jogger. Well, no, that there's no such thing as a jogger. You're a runner. Right. Right. And, um, and so it's just kind of people feel like they're going to be judged if they say that they run and they don't look like the guy that just won the Olympics or they don't look like Kara Goucher or whatever. And they're not yeah. little, little tiny shorts. Their shorts are a little bit longer and baggier. <laughs> You know, they might have a cotton t-shirt and not some little tiny singlet. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, it, it's the act of moving forward and moving forward in a pace that you become a little bit of breathless. That's called running. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I can speak a little bit personally on that because I identified as, you know, I, I lifted weights and that was kind of my MO for years. And I recently switched more so into running and I would, I would do that too. I would go into my local stores, my super runner shop in the city. And I would go, I mean, I'm not like really a runner, but, and then all mm -hmm. of a sudden I was running a marathon and I still felt like that. I still felt like I'm not, I'm not really a runner, but I'm, I'm doing a marathon and I need some shoes. Mm -hmm. And so that's also what we want to talk about here. You guys, if you're interested in running and if you're running at any capacity, you're a runner. So welcome to the club. You're part of us now and enjoy all the information that we have for you. <laughs> uh, um, so comparing you said something important about, you know, the, the mental aspect of running. There was a study done that gathered, um, it surveyed somewhere around 1,200 people that identified themselves as runners. And the length of time that these people have been running was anywhere between one to two months to 20 plus years. And I think the average was like six to seven years. So, you know, 
pretty decent running, but it, it had a curve. Everyone was included in the answers. And one of the things that they asked was, what was your motivator in 2019 for running compared to what was your motivator in 2020 for running? And if you looked at 2019, the majority of it was preparing for competition or race and then exercise, fitness, um, stress reduction, and just enjoyment and activity. And then if you look at it in 2020, obviously sport to competition was somewhere around 6% of what people would do. The majority was enjoyment, outdoor time, and just general exercise and fitness. And so it kind of almost brought us back to what the, what back to basics of why are we running in the first place? It's not always to train for a race, but you know, we have legs and we can use them for other activities as well. Just clear your mind, especially amongst the pandemic, right? Yes. And, and typically my <laughs> husband, um, after being with me for a day or so would say, do you need to go for a run? <laughs> like go. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah. Yeah. So it, it's helpful to everyone. Believe me. It is. It totally is. Um, did you find that you were selling more to new runners or more to a hundred percent? We picked up a lot of new runners. Um, we saw a lot of old shoes. We did uh, virtual fitting. So we did fittings by zoom. And oh, cool. How'd you yeah, do that? We did, we did a little gate analysis. You had to set your yep. iPad down and walk, walk away from us and, and that sort of thing. And it wasn't a hundred percent, but we could qualify people pretty well by just watching him do a couple squats, which um, we know we'll talk totally. about really important in making sure that you have the strong, um, the strength to actually run on a single leg, which is what running is, is a single legged sport. Mm -hmm. um, and so we saw, we saw a lot of people um, that were new and, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people say, well, my friend said I need to have Ugh, a always. Brooks running shoe. And yeah. it's like, they're great shoes, but that might not be the shoe for you just because they right. say it's the best shoe. So that was, that was something that we did a lot of education, a lot of talking to people. And we, you know, we dropped off and picked up a lot of shoes from houses. Oh, that's awesome. That's mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that you guys were able to do that. So another thing to think about is that COVID was pretty good for running. It was essentially helpful for runners. I mean, if you think about the fact that, yeah, our races are canceled and we didn't have a a literal finish line in sight. And this was something that I actually talked to Megan's good friend, Heather Peck, who is an elite master's runner about back in, I don't know, June of last year and how instead of, instead of losing your motivation because you didn't have any finish line in sight, it kind of gave people an opportunity to either reset or um, focus on things that they would always kind of push aside. For example, how many times have you gone out on a, on a run and said, I'm just going to start. I'm going to skip my warm up. I'll be fine because I only have an hour to do it. I'm sure a lot of our listeners have done that too. You go, okay, I have an hour. I want to run for an hour. I have 20 minutes. I want to run for 20 minutes, lace up and go. Or, um, you know, you don't get enough sleep at night because you've got to get up and you commute. Those things were taken away. So we were left with a little bit more time in the day. So we were left with more time to dedicate to getting better at what we're doing and whether it be a new runner, just simply getting out there and saying, oh, I have this extra hour. Now I'm going to exercise or a seasoned runner going, you know what? I'm going to do my strides before a speed workout instead of just going right into it. It was a great opportunity. And something that Heather had talked a lot about was the fact that um, a lot of us don't prioritize recovery. And by recovery, I mean sleep. I mean nutrition. I mean hydration. Those things are just as important, arguably more important than your hard workouts yourself. Um, what, what do you think about that, Megan? Well, I think um, what happened is the gift of time was given to all of us, um, especially people that were commuting into New York now had those extra hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And so it either worked in somebody's favor or it didn't um, in that they then decided that they were going to crush it every day. And, yeah. And we would True. see injuries that way, or it was just an opportunity for them to, to get out and use the time that they had that they had never had before. So that was pretty cool. So that's totally true that some people definitely overdid it myself included. I would just go out almost every day in May. Um, but then you realize in something that new runners don't necessarily know is like I just said, recovery is arguably more important than the actual workouts themselves because you're really taxing your body, especially when you're introducing yourself to a new activity like running. So if you've only been running for 
two to four months, your body is really still acclimating to the stresses that you're putting it under. And if you don't give it time and if you don't give it nutrition to kind of quote unquote heal the little micro traumas that you're causing, you're a leaving yourself more susceptible to an overuse injury Mm -hmm. and B you're not going to be able to perform at the capacity that you want to. And so what that can do is lead to frustrations of I'm not getting better. I'm doing this all the time and I'm not getting any better. Why? And my knee hurts. So those are some things that we're going to touch on a little bit later as well. Um, And I'm sure Megan, you've dealt with this a lot that people come in and they go, Oh, I'm running every day and my knee hurts. And I think I just need a new pair of shoes. And you probably say there are other things that we need to talk about here. It's not just the shoes. Um, So that kind of leads me into talking about common errors seen amongst new runners. So I'll touch on from my level of expertise, my my PT and my rehab um, findings, and then Megan can touch on what she sees coming into the store and, and with her experience as a very experienced runner. So just like I said, too much too soon is pretty much the recipe for disaster. And so people that are just getting into something, if you're excited about it and you find yourself doing it five days a week, like I said, it's not, your body just simply cannot adapt to those stresses enough to build up the tissue and build up the capacity to continue to handle it. A lot of people don't know exactly how to train in the beginning. And I was one of them. I would go online and Google a half marathon training program, and I would click on the first free PDF and do it. And sure, that might work for somebody, but you're probably not going to hit your goals and you probably aren't going to be doing anything that's specifically good for you. Um, wearing the wrong shoes, which I won't even talk about because that's your level of expertise and skipping things that aren't running. So cross training, strength training, which I'll touch on later, uh, warm up, cool down, mobility work, figuring out if you're actually ready to run in the first place. So those are errors that lead to a new runner fatigue, B new runner injury, and C just total lack of motivation because you're not getting anywhere, anywhere plateauing too quickly. What about you, Megan? What do you think? So, yeah, so we have a saying it's too much, too fast, too soon. And it, mm-hmm. you, you kind of touched on that. Yeah. And, um, you know, running is the reason running is so incredible is because it is a weight bearing sport. Um, mm-hmm. It's great for your bones. It's a proven fact that runners have better knees than anybody else. Yes. Um, they do not break your, it does not break your knees down. Um, and, and it rate and the raising and lowering of your heart rate is obviously cardiovascularly very totally. good. So there's so many benefits to running. However, some of us get started and they will go to a couch to 5k program that they Googled yep. and it says, start out running one minute and then run minute as fast as you can. And then one minute running and then one minute as fast as you can. Well, yeah. with this low bearing sport, you're, you're landing when you land, you're landing almost four times your body weight Mm -hmm. on the ground. If your tendons and ligaments haven't done that in years and you're going out and we always tell people, you should never go out and say, you're going to start a running program and run a mile for the first time. No, you should should go out and run for a minute, walk for four, run Mm -hmm. for a minute, walk for four. We do everything in five minute intervals so that you can be out for 40 minutes Yep. And you'll probably cover three miles with eight minutes of running yep. and the rest walking that raising and lowering is really fat burning and helps get everything in tune and ready yep. for the next couple of weeks. You master that. And then you go one and a half, three and a half, then yep. two, three, then three, two. And pretty soon you're running rather um, you're running continuously. The mistake that we make is either we ran at one point during our life during soccer practice in fifth grade And we remember that in fifth grade, we ran for the presidential fitness test. We ran a seven (sighs) mile. And um, I'm not going to say which sex, um, which gender tends to do this a little more than the others, but they usually will go out and try and repeat that seven (laughs) mile and, and they come back and they're toast. Um, And so that that's not good because they're only getting seven minutes of a workout versus 40. So I always kind of use 40 as that magic number, like get outside for 40 minutes. It's not, it's not an hour, it's a little more than half an hour. So you get a little credit there and, and pick flagpole or um, telephone poles to run, walk, run, walk, but do it very gradually. Um, And that way your tendons and ligaments, um, you know, are ready to bear that weight. Yeah. And I do the same exact thing. So obviously from a rehabilitation 
standpoint, people come to me when they've already gotten those injuries. It's very rare that someone comes and says, I feel great. I'm going to come to physical therapy and get a running analysis. It's all too rare. Um, but the same premise is when I have people return to running, we have an alter G treadmill in here, which is super to use, but you know, not everybody has access to that. So I'll often start them off on that just to get the feel of the motion and get their stride back at 70% of their body weight. And then I take them out of there and they either go on the treadmill while I watch them and they start off running for 30 seconds. And then they walk for two or three minutes and it's a frustrating thing, but it's the same idea as coming back from an injury as just getting into it, that simply your tendons and ligaments and your muscles are not ready for that load. And until you gradually expose them and expose them and expose them to that load, they're just not going to be as ready as you think they are. Exactly. Like Megan said, if you ran a 320 marathon eight years ago, that doesn't mean that you're going to run a 320 marathon this year. If you, if you ran a 20 minute 5k when you were in high school and now you're 40 and you want to get back into running that's not you you did that that's great that's super impressive but that's just not you right now and we like to use an example um especially if if um people on this call are over the age of 30 towards 40 um when you're younger and you were running that seven minute mile your tendons and ligaments look like the rope on a yacht a brand new, oh, yeah. they were white and beautiful and stringy in one direction. As we get a little bit older, they start to look a little bit more like the rope on a dinghy. Yep. And <laughs> some, some of the tendons may be peeling off a little bit. They're a little bit brown. They're definitely not stretchy. And so this is where you get into all of these problems. Yeah. And so there are also some signs. It's hard to know necessarily when you first get into this am I doing too much? Because you think I'm just running. If, if you're a new runner, you say you're running 20 minutes a day, every day. And that's, it's a totally subjective thing of doing too much. So it's, it's going to be completely personalized to you. And there are going to be some things and some signs and symptoms that you'll feel when you are doing too much. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your knee is going to hurt or your Achilles is going to hurt or your hamstring is going to be sore. You can feel like you're more fatigued than usual in general, in all of your aspects of life. Like you want to keep, just stay in bed. You can, when you go out for a workout, when you say, I want to run 20 minutes, that 20 minutes is a lot harder than it was two weeks ago when you weren't overloaded. Um, you may present with an injury you may have a lack of motivation and then you just kind of feel funky in other aspects of life. And I'm sure Megan, you've, you've had people talk to you when they don't know that they're doing too much. And it kind of just sounds like, Hey, maybe you need to step on the brakes or take an offload week, which we'll talk about. I think it, I think it's really a balance of, um, of combining your running and not running every day, but taking one of those days and doing strength training, taking yeah. one of those days and just walking the dog or, you know, walking down main street, um, and, and finding, finding that balance. Um, I know uh, for a fact, cause I probably am a victim of it, that running is very addicting because it's good mm -hmm. for my brain. So mm -hmm. I like the feeling of going out and running. However, I've never, I don't think in, in my life run every single day of the week. Um, and that makes me so happy. And, and, and you don't need to, to be a runner and you don't need to, there's, there's not a mileage that makes you a runner or makes you not. So you shouldn't feel stressed that, that your friend's running 30 miles a week successfully. And however, your body is really kind of at tilt at 10 miles a week. Yeah. Um, everybody, everybody's different and at different stages of their life and their, their functions. Yeah. So that's, that's the really important part that um, often novice runners think more is better and that the, the weekly mileage, for whatever reason, we've started to really put a lot of weight on our weekly mileage. I don't know why we picked each week or, you know, why we did that, but it's not necessarily the constant buildup of weekly mileage. And you want to just continue to infinitely increase weekly mileage. It's more of purpose to the miles that you're doing purpose to the minutes, not even the miles purpose to the minutes that you're putting in, in your workouts each week. Um, I usually give my, my clients and my patients the 80, 20 rule that really 80% of your runs should be easy and relaxed and just, you know, get your aerobic base, challenge your heart rate. And then 20% of your runs should be, you know, taking in mind, whatever your goals are, whether it be speed, whether it be Hills, that kind of thing. And that's putting more purpose into what you're doing, which kind of feeds me into saying how important it is 
to either get yourself involved in a, a group where some member of this group or the leader of the group is knowledgeable on this kind of stuff or set yourself up with a running coach. There are so many options these days. You don't even need to meet with someone face to face. You go online and look up a running coach or talk to any friend that you have that successfully used one. Word of mouth, you're going to get someone that you that you can trust and that will program something that's going to work for you and have purpose for you. And I know Megan, you've got a huge community. Of yes, coaches we have and groups. We have training programs and and um yeah. and those usually follow along that. Um we say 80% Brady bunch. So if you can, <laughs> if you can run 80% of the time and sing the Brady Bunch song or the, another song like that, SpongeBob SquarePants, <laughs> I don't know, something that, that you can sing and talk, or that if you're running with somebody that you can, you can say, Hey, Britt, what'd you have for dinner last night? And Britt says, I had a pizza. She can speak it. Right. And that's, that's endurance pace. And that's, you're right. I did have pizza. Yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> that's where your cardiovascularly muscle wise, everything you're going to have the biggest gain is mm -hmm. that fat burning pace. Yep. You get done with the run. And for about a half an hour after you're still you're burning, burning, you're burning some, some, uh, some calories and your body is getting all back together. And then that 20% is at that sort of stay in a life pace yep. where you're, you know, kind of breathing a little bit harder. That being said, not everybody is meant to do that. Totally. And, um, and I know um, I have raced for for many, many, many years and um, and I don't really do speed work anymore because I know that my tendons and ligaments are on the older side and they really don't like it when I do that. Yeah. So it, it's something that you really have to you can test and play around with. And that's why it's good to seek advice. It is. It's, it's good to seek advice. And it's it's hard to do when you don't necessarily know what you're doing, which is why we're so glad to be having this conversation. Um, because to Megan's point, some people don't wouldn't recognize that maybe speed work isn't for them. And it also depends on what is your goal. Um, and that's why groups and coaches and anyone that's really experienced in the field and we're everywhere is such a great thing to have and just a great resource to have. And it's really important, not only just to kind of get included within the sport and within the community that you have available to you, but just for, for your own personal success. Um, I do speed work maybe two days a week and I feel great with it. And the other four days or three, day, three days, realistically that I'm running, I'm slow as a snail and I'm enjoying myself. And that's good. Hey, Britt, we have a question. Somebody was asking oh. what the best wearable advice or app to use uh, is. And I, I can speak to that quickly. Go for it. Britt mentioned Strava. Strava is yes. awesome. It really is Facebook for athletes. It's motivating. Um, you can be private on it but it will give you really great feedback as to how you're progressing in different parts of your mm -hmm. um, run. Say you do the same route every day. Um, it will tell you if you're doing it faster or you're trending faster or yep. slower, it will give you awards for things. It's kind of, um, it's kind of, it's a really fun participatory thing. And it can be as, as public as you want it to be. It can be very private. Um, as far as um, when you're out running, Apps, phone-based apps are not typically the greatest thing if you want to know pace, heart rate, um, that sort of thing. Even Apple Watches, really, they're they're okay, but they're still just like a mini iPhone, so they're, right. they really don't have the same characteristics. We um, we carry and highly recommend um, Garmin. They are kind of the gold standard. They all have wrist-based heart rate, which is really mm -hmm. awesome. I'm going to take mine off right here so you can see it. Um, it's lit up right there. Awesome and, and accurate. Clinically awesome proven and accurate. Accurate. And when people say, well, is, is wrist-based heart rate as good as having a chest strap here? Well, the chest strap is the gold standard. It's right there where your heart is. Right. Um, this is perfectly fine unless you're planning to um, run in the Olympics this year. Then you might want the wrist, the chest strap. Right. Totally um, agree with that. So you might get a little lag on this because it is it is at the end of your arm um, that when you get to the top of the hill, your heart rate might be already really elevated, but it might not show it for a couple seconds till you get down the hill because it, the blood's got to go, the pulse has got to go up and down your arm. Uh, for the most part, it's really, really accurate. The GPS on it can track your pace, can track your minutes per mile, can track um your total workout, it'll give you your heart rate and your, your efforts. It'll give you your stride length and all sorts of things like that. So, so we recommend Garmin's There are a couple other, um, 
brands out there that are probably just as good. I'm just not familiar with them. Um, Garmin start at 199 with the risk-based heart rate. Sometimes they come down to 149. We always honor that, but it's really, it's a fun, fun thing to do, um, to have with you. Um, and it's also, if you are inspiring a child, um, get them a Garmin. If you, they're going to be using screen time for anything, have them use it for their fitness app. Um, it tracks their sleep. Give, it will give you that recovery and feedback that um, Britt's been talking about that's super important. It does, yeah. And, and that's kind of a cool thing to do. I wear this aura ring because that, that mm. tracks my recovery and something called heart rate variability and, and your resting heart rate and how you sleep and how recovered you are based on your activity the day before. But the Garmin kind of does it all in one. I think when we talk about wearables, it's also important to talk about not getting so obsessed with them that you almost are like competing against your wearable. So something that a lot of people do, myself included, um, is find it that it's it's almost hard to, to take it easy because if you see your pace and you see it constantly, you have constant feedback that, oh, wow, well, I'm running a little faster than usual, even though you're supposed to be doing an easy day, you're kind of competing against that wearable. And, and I've heard other running coaches say that it's tough um, for all of their clients to be compliant with that 80% of easy running because you're constantly kind of, it's something totally internal within us as runners that we're constantly trying to compete a little bit. Um, and that's detrimental rather than helpful. So something that I do as often as I can while maintaining my sanity is just go and like take my watch off and just kind of, I, I do track it on my phone, but I don't look at it on my phone in my mm -hmm. defense, just so mm -hmm. I, you know, can log it into my mileage. And I think it's important that we don't get too addicted to the wearables. I'm sure you've had that experience as well, Megan. I'm sure anyone out there who has a wearable now, I mean, I even just use an Apple watch and it, although it's not the most accurate, I find myself looking at it to the point that the last marathon I trained for, I started to get shoulder pain because of how often <laughs> I was doing this. I'm not even making that up. Training for a marathon, I hurt my shoulder. Um, so that's an important thing to, to factor in as well. Megan, do you wear your Garmin all day? I do wear my Garmin all day because it gives me a lot of feedback that, um, yeah. especially if I'm, if I'm training for something. Yes. Um, and am I a slave to it? No, I don't usually look at the sleep because I don't want to watch to tell me whether I slept well or not when I think I did. And it said, oh no, you really only slept for an hour. Another and a half. good point. Yeah. <laughs> Such Another a bummer. Um, but, <laughs> but I do keep it because it gives me overall statistics that I like, I like to see. And I don't, I don't live by my, I don't live by my app. And lots of times I'll turn my watch on and I won't look at the, the entire run um, just because I just want to run for real feel. And that's, that's, that's your 80%, right? Yep, exactly. So we have another question. And the question is what types of recovery methods do you recommend or prescribe to clients? So that's a great question. And it's, it's a very broad term recovery, but mine is more so listen to your body and sleep, prioritize sleep. That's when your body is gonna go into recover, real recovery mode and all those little um, elves in your body are repairing your muscles and making you ready for what's going on in the next day. And that's why a lot of these apps and trackers really focus on how well is your sleep and what's going on with your heart rate and your heartbeat while you're sleeping because that can, they can compare it to what you did the next day and say, okay, this is what you're ready to do tomorrow. Um, I also think that nutrition is super important because a lot of people don't know when and what to fuel themselves with before, during a long run and after a run, um, especially when you're first getting into it. I remember thinking that carb loading meant eat pasta all of the time and you'll run better. And that's just, it's just simply not what it is. So getting advice from experts in that field, whether it be a dietitian or a nutritionist is super important and just really prioritizing sleep. What do you guys what do you guys uh, tell your, your clients, Megan? We, we do the same thing. Uh, well, I get nutrition questions all the time. If you're really struggling with the nutrition, go to a registered dietitian, mm -hmm. not just somebody that's a nutritionist. Um, yep. And then just eat clean. Um, yeah. Listen, I, I try to eat really the perimeter of the grocery store, which is, we yep. do that all the time. It's true. That's where the yep. best food lives. Um, and then it's just really after that, planning your meals. 
Um, so that if you have to run at five o'clock after work or 5.30 after work, probably around three o'clock, you should have some sort of a carb mm -hmm. de dense food, um, whether it's a cliff bar, whether it's a convenience thing, or it's, you make yourself a little peanut butter sandwich or a peanut butter right. tortilla, um, those sorts of things so that you have that energy. Um, if you don't have that time frame from three to five to eat something like that, and you only have a half an hour, then grab a jelly belly or um, raisins or something that has like a quick sugar hit that might give you a little pickup if you're just going out for a 40 minute run or so. Um, we could talk all day about, all about day. training and fueling for longer runs. But as you're a new runner, um, when you get done with the run, um, first of all, always be hydrated. You can never drink enough water. It seems like, um, totally. except, except for when it's hot out. And then you do need those little Gatorade type things, things mm -hmm. that have electrolytes. We sell them at the store noon, which has no calories, but has that electrolyte in it. Mm -hmm. if it's really hot and you're sweaty. Um, right. When you get done working out, a lot of us are trained to think, oh, I just burned 500 calories. Now I don't want to put something into my body. Well, if you're planning on working out the next day, the time to replace your muscle stores is right then. Right Absolutely. Then. So Absolutely. you have like a 35 to 40 minute window to get some good food packed in there, something that's nutrition dense. Your mm -hmm. body's going to be super happy and it's going to be easier for you to go into that run the next day because your yeah. glycogen stores are all topped off. Yeah. And, and you don't necessarily want to say to your point of, oh, I just burned 500 calories. Let me eat something light. You want to put some carbohydrates in you. You want to put some healthy fats in you. And I think plus, another thing, yeah, plus, I'm going to interrupt really quick. Yeah. Plus, if you are that person that thinks, oh, I just did this workout and I maybe want to lose some weight. And so I don't want to eat right away. Eat while the furnace is burning, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then it's, it's in and out. It's in and out. But another thing is the same as what Megan was saying of, oh, my friend told me I need Brooks. My friend told me that I need to eat a, a, an English muffin with peanut butter on it before I run. You're going to find what works for you. And even if it's something totally weird, it works for you. Whatever works for you is what's going to be what fuels you the best. Mm -hmm. So I, I used to think that I'm sure a lot of you guys used to think that because we hear, oh, peanut butter and banana is the best thing to eat, but you're yeah. going to find that, okay, if I eat 45 minutes before I go out on this run, it works for me. Take that and run with it without being corny and saying, take that and run with it. <laughs> um, so Megan, I think that we should use our remaining time to talk about what is important other than just running. We've done a lot of running and I want you to just take the floor and maybe talk our listeners through what an experience is like when they walk in the doors of Darian running um, yeah. or field running and yeah. what to expect. So I'm just going to quickly talk, talk about um, how much I'd love you to all come to my stores. But at the end of the day, I don't, I'd love you to come to my stores, but um, I, if you don't just go to a run specialty store, do not buy your shoes at Dick's Sporting Good. Do not buy them on Zappos. Do not buy them on Amazon. We are all the same prices. All run specialty stores are the same prices as Amazon. If Amazon is less, we will research it and, and honor that price, but it's probably because it was the shoe from four models ago. So, so don't trust that pricing. Um, you may be getting an old shoe and believe it or not, even though a shoe hasn't been worn, if it's a year old, um, sort of all of the foam in the shoe starts to harden a little bit. So, so you have to be really careful of that. Um, when is it time to get a new shoe? When you start a new running program, it's nice to, to get yourself a new shoe, not the ones that are grass stained with lawnmower. Um, you know, when you mow the lawn, that's the worn <laughs> shoe, not your dad's old shoe. Um, but I'm going to show you something really quickly. All shoes are meant to bend this way because this is where your foot articulates to run. A shoe that you can take, and we call it the taco test, and be folded in half this way, it means that that shoe, all of the mid foam has been, or the midsole has been compressed out. So if you can put your finger, your thumbs through the spot right there, you can fold it in half. Now, some shoes instinctively do this. If you run in a Nike free, know that you're going to be absorbing a lot of impact if the shoe crunches up like this. Um, so you want to, you want to end up or start with a shoe that's new that I can't for the life of me fold in half. So that's the first thing that we'll do is it's great always to bring in your previous shoe if you have it so that we can see what you're running in and what we talk about what you liked it about it. Um, we also do a 3D gait analysis. Um, we do a 3D scan of your foot and then we do a gait analysis to help you find the right shoe um, for you. And just like Britt said, 
just because somebody told you that you need to be in the Brooks Beast doesn't mean he may weigh 400 pounds and the Brooks Beast is awesome. It's the best shoe for him and you weigh 110 pounds. The Brooks Beast is like going to be a four pound shoe for you. Um, so let us let us kind of narrow the shoe wall down to find you probably five or eight shoes to try. And then at the end of the day, the shoe that feels the best and makes you feel like you want to run out the, the store is the one that's going to be best for you. Um, be wary of, of a shoe store that says, this is the shoe you have to have. It's this one. This is the shoe that's going to get you to the Boston qualifying time that you want. The shoe that is, um, is going to be fast is the shoe that you feel fast in. Um, shoes now come from a regular shoe with um, fresh foam. This is a New Balance, so fresh foam midsole to shoes that now have a carbon plate put in them. You may have heard of a lot of them. They're setting world records um, in these shoes. That's not a shoe for a first timer. And it's really not a shoe for a 10, 11, 12 minute miler. Those shoes with carbon that cost $250 or 180 to 250 um, don't last as long. And they also really only the faster runners reap the benefit of that carbon bend. Um, and also carbon shoes, if you get one because you want to run a fast race, they're meant to be run in once a week, twice a week. Um, they do not bend like this shoe bends here. The carbon plate comes all the way through. And so you're kind of forgetting this part and you're just running like that. After time, that can place a lot of stress on, on knees. Um, yep. And Brit, we'll see. I mean, carbon plated shoes are pretty new. I think we'll give it a year and the PT... Um, PT visits are going to be up because somebody likes, feels really fast in a carbon shoe and they wear it all the time and you yeah. can't, you shouldn't. So what do you say to people who, let's say newer runners that are getting into a training plan and they ask you, do I need another shoe for my faster runs? What do you, do you suggest that? Well, I own a shoe store, so I want you to buy as many shoes <laughs> as possible. Um, but in reality, we should have two pairs of shoes. Um, and I actually, well, I have a bajillion pairs of shoes, but, um, I like people to have two or three pairs of shoes. Um, one, cause if one pair gets wet, um, or you just took it on a long run and you need to use it the next day, shoes kind of need to rest. The foam needs to kind of come back. Mm -hmm. Um, also we have shoes that are stability shoes and shoes that are neutral. And it used to be that if we saw anything called pronation, which is when your foot yeah. moves in this way, we put you in a stability shoe. Now we may see somebody who's completely flat-footed and pronating, but they're not injured. So their body's corrected for it. Yep. So then we keep them in a neutral shoe. However, if they're training for a longer distance and they want those longer runs, they may get a stability shoe for those tired days. Their foot doesn't have to work as hard. Totally. Um, insoles are also a really huge part. People think of it as, um, as running stores trying to make an extra buck. They actually customize the shoe quite a bit and will help the shoe married to your foot a little bit better. Yep. So we're big. We like to fit people for shoes because if you Brit and I have the same size shoe, you may have a really high rigid arch and I may have a really flat floppy foot and that size shoe that we wear is made for both of us. And so yep. tailoring the shoe a little bit more super important. That's an interesting way of thinking about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in and out, someone that comes there is probably there for what, how long? Um, half an hour. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's great yeah. service. And you're getting something that will totally benefit you because one of the things that can lead you to an injury is wearing improper footwear. So to Megan's point of the fix to fix pronation or to not fix pronation, I'm of the same mantra, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because we have muscles that are supposed to keep your arch up. And so sometimes at rest, your foot might look like it's flopping in. But if you get you on the treadmill and you're not in pain and it looks fine, then you can wear whatever shoe you feel comfortable. And I, I have the same mantra as that. Leading me into another issue that could lead you to injury and, and things to do other than just run, which is also a question that we just got. And I'll get to the, the other question as well, but what do you recommend for strength exercises for runners and warming up and cooling down? I actually put together like five or so slides to show a couple bang for your buck exercises. And Britt, just so that you know, uh, Performance Optimal Health has helped Ridgefield Running Company and Darien Running Company build a trifold brochure that will oh, be great. out probably next week showing these simple um, exercise, strength exercises. Wow. So it will be in our toolbox of stuff to give you. Cool, yeah. awesome. And yeah, these are five things. And I don't know, I would say that these would take you somewhere between 10 and 12 minutes to do. And if you add them in three to four times a week, you're kind of setting yourself up 
um, to be more ready for that, like Megan referred to earlier, that single leg squat that you're repeatedly doing again and again and again with running. So we're going to take you through, I just have an image of all of them and I, you know, I won't talk too much, but lateral band locks, we see a lot of people doing these. So if you look down here, there's an elastic band around my ankles and I'm simply walking sideways. So what this does is activate a muscle on the side of your hip called your gluteus medius, which is arguably the most important muscle to keep you upright when you're on one leg, which is what you're doing. There's no point in running that you're on both of your feet, whereas walking you are. Um, so it's super important to be stable on one leg. This is going to strengthen your gluteus medius. And I have some tips that I'm, I'm not just going to read the slides to you, but if it's too easy, there are things you can do. If it's too hard, there are things that you can do. So the next one is a single leg Romanian deadlift. So again, you're on one foot and what you're trying to do is balance yourself on that one leg while you move your torso, which is also what you're doing when you're running. Your torso is moving. Think of arm swing. You're kind of rotating through your step, um, keeping your hips and your pelvis balanced. So this gets your core involved. This gets the entire lateral and posterior leg involved um, and is just a super bang for your buck exercise. Next one is a lateral step down. So this is actually something that I use when I do my analysis of a runner if they come in. And if you can't stand on a step and let your other leg drop down without your stepping leg totally falling apart, then you're really not ready to be doing that and jumping up and down. Essentially, right, Megan, running is hopping up and down on one leg, landing, bounding, landing, bounding, landing, bounding. If you can't do that on a stationary item, that there are definitely some biomechanical things that we need to address. That being said, if it does look good, it's a great exercise to do to continue to improve your single leg squat. So you when just, you, just, just to clarify that for a second, because yeah. that's a really nice slide. When you're talking about collapsing, um, mm -hmm. you're talking about the foot, the leg that's on the step, yeah. um, the knee collapsing towards the the falling foot yeah or your hips yeah yep so jumping I off to three the things three things i have the person tucking their shirt i think my shirt's tucked in in this picture and i look at what the waistband is doing if the waistband goes from here to here from from um parallel to the ground to a little bit at an angle then you're you're losing the gluteus medius control if your knee starts to face inward rather than 12 o'clock right over your first and second toe then again it's it's indicative of likely a hip weakness um, and then you can also look at the foot here because you can kind of fall into pronation right megan especially if your knee is falling inward and that shows why not everybody who pronates needs a stability shoe because it could be coming from as high up as your hip and you could be able to control it. So this is a great exercise that identifies weaknesses and then also improves them. Do you do these exercises like 10 each side? I do them for more repetition because you're not just running for 10 steps. So what I usually will do when I analyze someone is I'll have them do either 30 or a, about 30 to 45 seconds of it. And I'll suggest 12 to 15 repetitions because that's, that's where you get more into the endurance phase of strengthening. Awesome. Good question. So the next one is a side plank. So a side plank can actually strengthen your glutes really effectively. We think of planks for our abs, um, which are just as important, but your side plank, um, you're actually using your glutes to keep your hips from falling down. So this is a super easy way to do it. And there are a million ways to either make this easier or harder, and you can do it while you watch TV. And then I think the last one. See, that, the planks are an awesome commercial break. They are an awesome commercial break. I wish I did them more often. Mm -hmm. The last one is just a lunge to balancing. Um, so I, I also have a little asterisk at the top of all of these that say perform without shoes on to challenge your feet because your feet need to be nice and strong. Even though you've got these great shoes on, your feet still need to be working with every step that you take. Um, and so what we're doing here is you're just stepping backwards into a lunge and then coming up relatively quickly and balancing on that leg. So when I step backwards in this photo, my right leg is working. And then when I step forward, my right leg is balancing. So that goes back to stabilizing when you're on one leg and then, you know, strengthening the quads, the glutes, the hamstrings as well. So those are five easy ones. It took me two minutes to talk about them. It'll take you 10 minutes to do them. Um, and you guys will have access to these images as well afterwards and just throw it in three times a week after your harder workout that's not quite as long, add these in and it'll, uh, it'll definitely help your performance as well. When you're lunging, um, Britt, where do you tell people that, that their knee should track over? First and second toe. 
And the rule of your knee cannot go in front of your toe is not always applicable. Some mm -hmm. people have longer tibias and longer femurs than other people. You wanna be relatively looking like that, that first picture in that your knee isn't way over. My big thing is your front heel just has to be on the ground. If your front heel is off the ground, then you're not quite doing a lunge, you're more so doing a hip flexor stretch for mm -hmm. the other leg. So as long as your heel is down and you're in control, track that knee over that first and second toe because the same thing can happen. That collapse inward that happens on the step down um, can happen in a lunge and a squat as well. So Megan, that's probably why you guys look at squats to see what people are doing mm -hmm. from their hips. Do you see more collapse in women or men? More collapse in women. Unfortunately, we are anatomically a little bit different in that our pelvis is a little wider than men. So instead of our femurs going more straight down, just like Megan showed, they, they kind of go inward a little bit. So we're more susceptible to that collapse happening inward, which means we've got to really be conscious of it. So we can take the slides away. And then I think one good thing to end on is to talk about, and Megan, you've got a great grasp on this. How, how do people get involved in the running community? People that are new, that have been doing it by themselves, what next? So we have tremendous um, opportunities for running communities. We have runs on Tuesdays and Friday mornings at Darien Running Company and Sundays, um, and then Saturdays in Ridgefield. And then we're starting trail runs, which is a whole nother Ooh. incredible, yeah. <laughs> wonderful thing to do, especially if you're a new runner, because you, there is no pace in, in trail running. It's up and down. Sometimes you're walking, sometimes you're running sometimes, and it's really good for your body because it's mm -hmm. very mindful. So not only is it good for your brain, but you're watching things and it's almost like you're conducting a symphony with your feet, trying to make sure that you're navigating things correctly, which is better than pounding the pavement every day. Um, so we have those starting at the end of April. Um, and then there's, you know, Strava, we have a Strava club. So we have meetups all the time. We also just launched a brand community called Radar, um, which is really just about meet up, meetups and community and trying to get people together to run. Um, you know, we've, we're, which is a great thing. We're moving away from meeting people at bars and restaurants and meeting them out on the road. Um, which is a incredibly, I'm sorry for the bars and restaurants, but it's an incredibly happy place to be. And, um, and so we've got a lot of opportunity there. Also just reaching out to your friends and, yeah. and getting somebody, you know, Hey, I'll meet you at six o'clock tomorrow, tomorrow morning, um, finding somebody to be accountable to. You guys don't have to be the same pace. You could, nope. if you're faster, you could run out, turn around, circle back, meet the person, run out, circle back. Um, it's just having that person that is making you accountable for doing something. That's great. Um, so there's, there's a ton out there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure if you even weren't in this area and you wanted to um, find out, go to Facebook and look for running yeah. groups. Oh, there's plenty. Yeah. Facebook, Google, they're, they're everywhere. And I, I highly suggest doing it. I belong to one in the city and I fully plan on joining a new one when I join Fairfield County. They're motivating because sometimes, you know, you, if you wake up one day and you really don't feel like doing it, Sometimes that's arguably the more important day to do it, you know, mm -hmm. push yourself and do it. And if people are waiting for you, you're going to do it. We always say beats a blank. Yeah. Um, so if you get up in the morning and you just don't feel like moving, give yourself 10 minutes, give yep. yourself to the corner. And usually by the time you get to that spot, you're if going. you turn around and come back, you've doubled your time and that beats a blank. <laughs> Otherwise, usually by the time that, you, you know, you've worked that bad guy off the shoulder and the good guy's going and your brain's going and yeah. you can make it. So it's awesome. So we have a couple minutes left. Um, there's one question that we didn't answer yet. And then guys, feel free to enter any other questions into the Q&A tab. So here was one. What cross training methods do you recommend for people who are trying to get back into running slash improve their running? Um, my very annoying answer to this is it depends. I think Megan, you probably agree, but if you're just getting into running, I don't want to overload you by saying when you're not running, get on a bike, when you're not running swim, although I do love swimming mm -hmm. as a cross training exercise, I would say instead of focusing on more volume of activity, use your non-running days for your strength days and your mobility days to really iron out all of that. Make sure you're ready to start a good program and then go from there. But um, in general, if you have access to a pool, I think swimming is fantastic cross training. Um, what about you? Yoga, Megan? yoga, yoga. So yoga, um, and and if you take yoga and you are a runner, 
it's, it's always a yoga instructor. They'll say, oh, you must be a runner because you can't touch your toes or whatever. Yeah. Well, a lot of that, do not let that sway you. Do what you can there. Yoga is more about strength and balance. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the part that benefits you as a runner versus the, the stretching. And, yeah. and you can always have a little snap back to that yoga instructor and say, you know, one of the reasons why I'm not bending myself into that box or that ball um, is because I'm a runner and I need that tension in my ligaments yeah. and my ligaments aren't made to do that, but I'm going to go as far as I can. Cause I know it's really good for me. Yeah. So y- yoga is great. Um, and to Britt's point, if you're starting running for the first time, don't also take up tennis and don't also take mm-hmm. up um, ping pong or something else, because <laughs> then you won't be able to, to, to know, is it the, the running that I'm doing or is it the tennis that I'm doing? You know, what is introduce one variable at a time try a new running shoe, then try a speed work after the running shoe, you know, works so that when you come back to to the running store or you go to the physical therapist, you can say, well, this is the one thing that I did differently versus, Mm -hmm. well, I I got a new pair of carbon shoes. I started playing tennis. I was really good at it. And I did, and I took a yoga class and then I, and then I did my running, my hill repeats or something. Well, Mm -hmm. it's never going to know what is actually causing the problem. So slowly. Yeah. Yeah. And then one that I totally forgot about that I recently got into is Pilates. I think mm-hmm. it's so fantastic. Uh, whether you do a group setting, uh, whether you do mat, whether you do reformer, whether you do one-on-one, it really, if anything else, first of all, it obviously targets your core and your, and your glutes and really full body, but it gets you really in tune with where your body is in space, which is only going to help you with your running form and your awareness of your body and your awareness of just in general with your running. That's, that's totally important in your training. And, you know, just to, to recap really quickly or clarify really quickly, um, when we talk about core training, we don't talk about just your six pack. We actually mm-hmm. talk about everything from right beneath your chest till till your quads. That's yeah. all there's, there's muscles that are all interconnected um, that are super important to keeping your hips in line. So um, that's, that's part of the thing that, you know, it's part of the most important thing. We got a good one from Heather and it's a great point. Run safety is something that isn't always addressed. Um, so when people say, what's your favorite running headphone, it's not smart to be running with music. You can't hear if a car is coming behind you. You can't hear if a person is coming behind you. It's one of your senses that you rely on to know where you are and what's going on around you. So it's really not the smartest to do if you must use one, not the other, um, reflective gear is infinitely important at night. Um, cars may not see you if you're wearing just your regular clothes. So whether it be a vest or a headlight or the combination of the two, I'm sure Megan, you've got, you guys have all of that Mm -hmm. in the store. Um, I run against traffic, run Run against against traffic. traffic. Yes. So you need to make eye contact, um, no matter what time of the day, just because a car is coming at you and it looks like it sees you make sure that you make eye contact with that person's eyes because 99% of the time they are updating their Facebook status because they just got a cool ice cream. So, so making sure that you are aware of your senses all the time. We actually sell um, headsets that, that play that are bone conducting. So you can hear what's going oh, yeah. on um, if you must um, listen to music, if that's your, your diversion or your thing, but um, really running against traffic, being hyper aware of your senses. Um, you know, sometimes we get lost in our own brain and we start to cross the street and we're not looking ourselves. So a lot of running accidents happen are, um, a runner, 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 um, induced, I guess, versus, um, versus the, uh, car. Um, another one is, and especially ladies, I hate to say this, but at night, please don't run alone. It's just not the smartest thing to do. It's you've heard too many stories, save it for the morning. If you're going out at 9 PM or do it with a buddy, yes, always and- let somebody know both Strava and Garmin um, and most apps will actually have a beacon. So if yeah. I'm going out for a run um, by myself, I'll turn it on so that my husband can see where I am. Yeah. Um, so that's super important too. But yeah. um, for the most part, our roads are really windy and terrible here. And we have very distracted drivers. You have to assume that they are not seeing you. And so you have to be prepared. And, you know, we just can't, we have to stay on our toes on this sort of thing and just really be mindful of running against traffic, making sure that you make eye contact and then, then you should be good. I mean, I've logged and 
thousands of miles on these roads. Um, I've been hit by a car on my bike, but not on my, not running. So, um, you know, I think that, that the chances, I think that our roads are safe. If you yeah. pay attention, you shouldn't be afraid. And there's a lot of places that have sidewalks and we have a lot of great rail trails and crushed limestone paths around that you can seek out too if you just don't feel confident running on the road. That's good to know. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? I think we hit everything. I think so too. This was awesome, Britt. Thanks for this having me. This was great, Megan. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, um, our emails will be available. Um, I think they might already be in the email that you guys signed up to the Zoom link. We're always ready to answer any questions, eager to answer any questions. I guess you probably got the vibe that we're pretty passionate about this. Um, and that's that. Go to Ridgefield Running, go to Darien Running, buy some shoes. Call me if you get injured and enjoy it. Well, also, Britt, really quickly, Performance Optimal Health, you can you can go there to oh, we can do strong too. So you don't have to be yeah. injured. To, you to don't have to be injured be just there. for a yeah. quick intro. We offer everything under the sun. So if you've gone for a long run and you want some Norman Tech recovery boots for 20 minutes, we've got you. If you need a massage after running hard for a week and it's your off week, come, we'll get, we'll give you a massage therapist. Um, prehab, Heather. And you have that crazy like, ice. You have that crazy ice chamber. chamber. We have cryotherapy, yes. yes, which is intimidating to a lot of people. The ice chamber can be intimidating, although I love it. I sleep like a baby afterwards. But we also have a local one that looks like an industrial strength steamer and it's frozen nitrogen and it is a laser that measures your temperature of your body and it's got a scientifically proven temperature that's the target for each part of the body. So if your knee is feeling a little wonky and you want some cryo to your knee, it feels great. But uh, to Heather's point, prehab is the best rehab. So come in, get a screen. I'm happy to do a screen with you point out any kind of deficits that you might have that you could work on. It by no means means that you need to do formal physical therapy. So don't think of this as I'm injured, go see a physical therapist. Think of, I want to, I want to extend my career. I want to make sure that I'm doing the right things and I want to do it the right way. And I'm happy to give you some tips and just send you on your way to do them by yourself. Awesome. All right, guys, everyone go eat a nutritious dinner and have a great night. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Megan. Bye-bye.